Hey, what's up, guys? In this video, I'm just uh, going to play like a few uh, clips of um, some YouTube videos that helped wake me up uh, to certain aspects of philosophy, you know, dealing with the society, um, objectivism, um, philosophy, um, psychology, stuff like that. And I just, uh, you know, I'm just going to play like little, little clips that really influenced me and, and really uh, opened my eyes to certain things. And the first one I want to play is um, this uh, interview from 1959, the Mike Wallace interview when he interviewed uh, Ann Rand. Now, Ann, I, I got to give a lot of credit, credit to Ann Rand. If, if I haven't been introduced to the, the writings of Ann Rand, uh, I'll probably by now I'll probably be like the stereotypical black conscious guy, you know. <laughs> I'll probably still be talking about the white man oppressing us, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, all this kind of stuff. I'll probably still, I'll probably st still would have the victim mentality, you know, if it was introduced to Anne Rand. But uh, this is like an old interview from '59. This is like one of my personal favorites. I'm not gonna play the whole interview. I'm just gonna play like the part one. It's like nine minutes long. So sit back and enjoy. This is Mike Wallace with another television portrait from our gallery of colorful people. Throughout the United States, small pockets of intellectuals have become involved in a new and unusual philosophy which would seem to strike at the very roots of our society. The fountainhead of this philosophy is a novelist, Ayn Rand, whose two major works, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, have been bestsellers. We'll try to find out more about her revolutionary creed and about Miss Rand herself in just a moment. And now to our story. Down through history, various political and philosophical movements have sprung up, but most of them have died. Some, however, like democracy or communism, take hold and affect the entire world. Here in the United States, perhaps the most challenging and unusual new philosophy has been forged by a novelist, Ayn Rand. Ms. Rand's point of view is still comparatively unknown in America, but if it ever did take hold, it would revolutionize our lives. And I, and to begin with, I wonder if I can ask you to capsulize, I know this is difficult, can I ask you to capsulize your philosophy? Well, what is Randism? Uh, first of all, I do not call it Randism, and I don't like that name. I right. call it Objectivism. All right. Meaning a philosophy based on objective reality. Now, let me explain it as briefly as I can. First, my philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute. That man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it. And that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality which has so far been believed impossible, namely a morality not based on faith. On or faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not on arbitrary edict, mystical or social, but on reason, a morality which can be proved by means of logic, which can be demonstrated to be true and necessary. All right, all right. Now, may I define what my morality is? All right. Because this is merely an introduction. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on earth and to live as a human being, he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold reason as his only guide to action and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness and that he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest may uh, i interrupt now you may because you bring you you put this philosophy to work in your novel atlas shrugged that's right you demonstrate it in, in human terms, in your novel, Atlas Shrugged. 
And let me start by quoting from a review of this novel, Atlas Shrug, that appeared in Newsweek. It said that you are out to destroy almost every edifice in the contemporary American way of life, our Judeo-Christian religion, our modified government-regulated capitalism, our rule by the majority will. Other reviews have said that you scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? Uh, yes. <laughs> I agree with the facts, but not the estimates of this criticism. Namely, if I am challenging the base of all these institutions, I'm challenging the moral code of altruism, the precept that m man's moral duty is to live for others, that man must sacrifice himself to others, which is the present-day morality. What do you Since mean by I sacrifice himself for others? This Now we're moment. getting to the point. One moment. Since I'm challenging the base, I necessarily would challenge the institutions you name, which are a result of that morality. All right. And now what is self-sacrifice? Yes, what is self-sacrifice? You say that you do not like the altruism by which we live. You, you like a certain kind of Ayn Randist selfishness. I uh, would say that I don't like is too weak a word. I consider it evil. And uh, self-sacrifice is the precept that man needs to serve others in order to justify his existence, that his moral duty is to serve others. That is what most people believe today. Well, yes, we're taught to feel concerned for our fellow man, to feel responsible for his welfare, to feel that we are, as religious people uh, might put it, children under God and responsible one for the other. Now, why do you rebel? What's wrong with this philosophy? But that is what, uh, in fact, makes man a sacrificial animal. That man must work for others, concern himself with others, or be responsible for them. That is the role of a sacrificial object. I say that man is entitled to his own happiness and that he must achieve it himself. Right. But that he cannot demand that others give up their lives to make him happy. Right. And right. nor should he right. wish to sacrifice himself for the happiness of others. I mm -hmm. hold that man should have self-esteem. Exactly. And cannot man have self-esteem if he loves his fellow man? What's wrong with loving your fellow man? Christ, every important moral leader in man's history, has taught us that we should love one another. Why, then, is this kind of love, in your mind, immoral? It is immoral if it is a love placed above oneself. It is more, more than immoral, it's impossible. Exactly. Because when you are asked to love everybody indiscriminately, that is, to love people without any standard, to love them regardless of the fact of whether they have any value or virtue, mm -hmm. you are asked to love nobody. But in a sense, in your book, you talk about love as if it were a business deal of some kind. Isn't the essence of love that it is above, uh, above self-interest? Uh, well, let me m make it uh, concrete for you. What would it mean to have love above self-interest? It would mean, for instance, that a husband would tell his wife, if he were moral, according to the conventional morality, that I am marrying you just for your own sake. I have no personal interest in it, but I am so unselfish that I am marrying you only for your own good. Well, should would, husbands and wives tally up? Would any woman up? like that? Should husbands and wives I am tally up at the end of the day and say, well, now, wait a minute. I love her if she's done enough for me today, or she loves me if, if I have properly performed oh, my functions. Is no. You misunderstood me. That is not uh, how love should be treated. I agree with you that it should be treated like a business deal, but every business has to have its own terms and its own kind of currency. And in love, the currency is virtue. Right. You love people not for what you do to, for them or what they do for you. You love them for the values, right. the virtues, which they have right. achieved in their own character. Right. You don't love causelessly. You don't love everybody indiscriminately. You love only and then, those who deserve it. And right. then if a man is weak or a woman is weak, then she is beyond, he is beyond love? He certainly does not deserve it. He certainly is beyond. He can always correct it. Man has free will. If a man wants love, he should correct his weaknesses or his flaws, and he may deserve it. But he cannot expect the unearned, neither in love, not in money, but you neither have, in matter nor spirit. You have lived in our world and you realize, recognize the fallibility of human beings. There are very few of us then in this world, by your standards, who are worthy of love. 
Uh, unfortunately, yes, very true. <laughs> but it well. is open to everybody to make themselves worthy of it, and that is all that my morality offers them. If they will A conduct... way to make themselves worthy of love, although that's not the primary motive. Uh, let's move ahead. Ha Well, that's the powerful interview right there. That's like one of my all-time favorite interviews. I could watch that interview over and over and over again. And it really uh, energized me when I first seen this whole interview. You can find this whole interview on, on YouTube. But like I said, it, every time I watch I could never get tired of it. Because what she said, is just cl for, for me, it just clicked. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, this whole idea of uh, you have to love everybody, everybody, love everybody unconditionally. Uh, and she, na she nailed it. She said, really, that's really impossible. Because honestly, nobody loves everybody. It's impossible to love everybody in the world. It's really like a cliche that, you know, rhetoric cliche, a cliche, whatever you want to call it, that's just been ingrained in society. To, to virtue signal like you know i love the world and i'm like no you don't <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's like all people we might love is like maybe your husband or wife your children your family your friends but the random person on the street uh you don't love the uh a starving kid in africa who you never met so the whole idea of love everybody doesn't make any sense but but anyway though that's like one of my favorite all-time interviews and everything but uh like I said, Anna Rand, you know, she really influenced me, you know. Yeah, I know a lot of people already know about my man Machiavelli. <laughs> Machiavelli, the badass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I, th I think a lot of people got introduced to Machiavelli when Tupac was around. You know, when he, you know he, he named his album. Uh, what's that, Machiavelli? You know, the album came out like back back in the day and everything. And uh, but you know, I, I like Machiavelli. I like uh, his uh, philosophy. A lot of people don't like Machiavelli because it's cutthroat. That's why I like it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, Machiavelli nailed it. You know what I'm saying? Because, uh, and, and, and I agree with him because if you really think about it, you know, people who are assertive, people who are aggressive, uh, they always dominate people who are passive, people who are peaceful, you know, because a lot of people think that a leader has to be this uh, this humanitarian, this pacifist, and this whole, in this perfect utopian society, which doesn't make any sense because the word utopia literally translates as no place or no such place so that basically means that utopia can never exist and never has been a utopia never will be a utopia plain and simple because the very word that break down the etymology of utopia means no place the latin word means no place place that doesn't exist you know that you could ever have a perfect society where there's no no crime you know no war you know that's uh impossible and uh, but but I just want to play this uh, short video that uh, school school of life put out a couple of years ago. I think they put us out either last year or year before last. But it's basically talk about uh the whole concept of nice guys in leadership. Machiavelli was a 16th century Florentine political thinker with powerful advice for nice people who don't get very far. His thought pivots around a central, uncomfortable observation, that the wicked tend to win, and they do so because they have a huge advantage over the good. They are willing to act with the darkest ingenuity and cunning to further their cause. They are not held back by those rigid opponents of change, principles. They will be prepared to outright lie, twist facts, threaten or get violent. They will also, when the situation demands it, know how to seductively deceive, use charm and honeyed words, bedazzle and distract. And in this way, they conquer the world. 
it's routinely assumed that a large part of what it means to be a good person is that one acts well. One doesn't only have good ends, one is committed to good means. So, if one wants a more serious world, one needs to win people over through serious argument, not clickbait. If one wants a fairer world, one has to judiciously and gently try to persuade the agents of injustice to surrender willingly, not through intimidation. And if one wants people to be kind, one must show kindness to one's enemies, not ruthlessness. It sounds splendid, but Machiavelli couldn't overlook an incontrovertible problem. It doesn't work. As he looked back over the history of Florence and the Italian states more generally, he observed that nice princes, statesmen and merchants always come unstuck. That's why he wrote the book for which we know him today, The Prince, a short, dazzling manual of advice for well-disposed princes on how not to finish last. And the answer, in short, was to be as nice as one wished, but never to be overly devoted to acting nicely and indeed to know how to borrow, when need be, every single trick employed by the most cynical, dastardly, unscrupulous and nastiest people who have ever lived. Machiavelli knew where our counterproductive obsession with acting nicely originated. The West was brought up on the Christian story of Jesus of Nazareth, the very nice man from Galilee who always treated people well and wound up as the king of kings and the ruler of eternity. But Machiavelli pointed out one inconvenient detail to this sentimental tale of the triumph of goodness through meekness. From a practical perspective, Jesus' life was an outright disaster. This gentle soul was trampled upon and humiliated, disregarded and mocked. Judged in his lifetime and outside of any divine assistance, he was one of history's greatest losers. The clue to being effective lies in overcoming all vestiges of this story. The prince was not, as is often thought, a guide to being a tyrant. It's a guide about what nice people should learn from tyrants. It's a book about how to be effective, not just good. It's a book haunted by examples of the impotence of the pure. The admirable prince, and today we might add CEO, political activist or thinker, should learn every lesson from the slickest, most devious operators around. They should know how to scare and intimidate, cajole and bully, entrap and beguile. The good politician needs to learn from the bad one, the earnest entrepreneur from the slick one. We are all ultimately the sum of what we achieve, not what we intend. If we care about wisdom, kindness, seriousness and virtue, but only ever act wisely, kindly, seriously and virtuously, we will, Machiavelli warns us, get nowhere. We need to learn lessons from an unexpected source, those we temperamentally most despise. They have the most to teach us about how to bring about the reality we yearn for, but that they are fighting against. We need weapons of similar grade steel to theirs. Ultimately, we should care more about being effective than about being nobly intentioned. It's not enough to dream well. The true measure is what we achieve. The purpose is to change the world for the better not reside in the quiet comforts of good intentions and a warm heart. All this Machiavelli knew. He disturbs us for good reason, because he probes us where we are at our most self-serving. We tell ourselves we didn't get there because we're a little too pure, good and kind. Machiavelli bracingly informs us we are stuck because we have been too short-sighted to learn from those who really know our enemies. Yeah, that video pretty much nailed it. And uh, if you really think about it, what uh, Machiavelli is, was saying in The Prince, uh, he can equate it to President Trump because, you know, a lot of uh, liberals, a lot of leftists, they they want this leader who's like uh, Bernie Sanders. They want a leader who's like this passive, peaceful, you know, soft-spoken noble looking guy like Obama, you know what I'm saying? They want a leader like that who will promise them stuff like promise them you promise them a utopia, equality for everybody, free shit. You know, but you know, but a leader like Trump, he's needed because you know, if you if you lead in the superpower, you gotta be tough. You know, he can't just be Mr. Nice Guy all the damn time when he 
when you're negotiating with countries like um, North Korea, you know, you know, if you, if you talk to if you're talking to somebody from North Korea or like Russia or China, or whatever, it can't be a soft cookie. You know, you got to be stern. You know, that, you know, that's why Trump got the job done with North Korea. You know, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying, you know, you know, same thing with uh, Mexico. You know, it's just the whole thing with the um, the travel bans and all this kind of stuff. The immigrants, uh, you know, if you lead in the country, you got to be tough. You know, you can't just be this uh, what they what they want you to be with this this soft humanitarian world leader. And if you think about it, any real leader who's who's soft and who's humanitarian are lame as fuck. Like Justin Trude like Trudeau guy in Canada, you know, he's soft as fuck, and that's why Canada is soft, you know. <laughs> or, or or these European countries, you know, their prime ministers are soft and cooked, you know, and you know, and those countries are getting fucked up. You know. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's just something that a lot of people don't consider because, you know, the quality of the quality of being a leader is got to be tough and stern and rugged. And uh, for some reason, you know, people who are looking for Messiah don't like that. Uh, this is a pretty good video. Uh, for some reason, uh, whoever put this video together, they put this video as unlisted. But if you go on my YouTube page, I have it in my playlist under Luciferianism. So if you go on my YouTube page and click on my playlist, uh, just click on the playlist entitled Luciferianism. Uh, this video is on here because you can't find this video with the normal like YouTube search engine because whoever put his video who uh, whoever uploaded it put on put it on unlisted unlisted for some weird reason but I don't know why they put it as unlisted because it's a very very good video and this video to me explains the whole SJW mindset to the T you know the whole thing about the social justice wars the liberals who are always complaining or always protesting yeah, uh, you know they hate the rich. You know they want their rights. They 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 entitled. This video right here nails it. I mean, I mean it's so crystal clear. And this video is about um, Frederick Nietzsche's uh, philosophy dealing with the slave morality and the master morality from his book, The Genealogy of Morality, or The Genealogy of Morals. But uh, it's an excellent video. It's a short video. It's like three minute video. Uh, but you know, when you watch it, you know, explains it to the T very well. Welcome to the Macat Multimedia Series, a Macat analysis of Friedrich Nietzsche on the genealogy of morality. Is it really self-evident that the best moral system is one that emphasizes compassion and virtue? Friedrich Nietzsche, a radical philosopher born in the mid-19th century, examined moral judgment in his three-essay work, on the genealogy of morality. He believed that feelings typically considered as moral, such as compassion, selflessness, and piety, were based on the Judeo-Christian religion, and he saw alternatives to this point of view. In his essays, Nietzsche identified two competing moral frameworks, the noble framework and the slave framework. Each, he thought, had its own definitions of good and bad. In the noble framework, Good is defined as meaning strong, powerful, brave. But in the slave framework, to be good is to be pious, compassionate, and virtuous. Masters, brought up to think in term of the noble framework, defined bad as weakness, impotence, something that was beneath the consideration of better men. But priests and slaves, using the slave framework, believed that bad encompassed power, strength, and haughty honor. Nietzsche states that the slave framework was created as a result of slaves and priests turning the noble framework on its head because of their repressed anger at their own situation. 
He therefore argued that the slave framework enshrined in Judeo-Christian ethics was a perversion of a pre-existing and superior moral framework. A reversal of moral standpoints, a transformation of moral sentiment. How does it happen? Let's consider fashion and how it can change. Imagine that it's fashionable to wear expensive, well-cut suits. Few people can access this fashion, and those who can consider themselves above the people who wear jeans. Just like the masters who used the noble framework, the suit wearers see those people who wear jeans as weak, poor, and pitiful. Bad characteristics indeed under a noble moral framework. The jeans wearers become angry at their inability to wear expensive suits. They would wear suits if they could, but since they don't have the wealth to do so, they decide to reverse their perspective instead and change ideas regarding what's fashionable. Led by media celebrities, people wearing jeans and casual clothing begin to believe that their style is more of a fashion statement than those who wear suits, and they start to condemn the suit wearers as showy and starchy. Just as those who wore jeans reversed the desired characteristics of fashion, so Nietzsche believed the slave framework was born from a similar kind of reversal in ideas. Nietzsche's philosophy is defined by its anti-traditionalism and radical individualism, and it broke ties with religious morality. A more detailed examination of his ideas can be found in the Macat analysis. Yeah, this is a that was a very very good video, and it really uh, let me just uh, log out here. But it really uh, drives home the whole mentality of the SJWs and their view of the world, you know, you know, because they have this. Uh, actually, it's, it's really envy, you know. They 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 protest the rich, you know. They protest, uh, you know, inequality stuff like that. It's really it's really just envy. Is pretty much all it is. Uh, but uh, but you know, if you're into Nietzsche, you know, I was you know I was I would suggest uh. Looking, look, looking up Nietzsche and uh, reading up on this material because he was like uh, one of my favorite philosophers and uh, very underrated. Hey, I just uh, want to briefly go over the um, the slave morality versus uh, the master the master morality, and uh, right here it's uh, comparing the two moralities, uh, master morality, uh, focus on those who are strong, powerful, or above the herd, um, concerned with ethical codes that emphasize excellence, virtue, strength, merit, and toughness, uh, legitimizes power differentials orients toward hierarchical or authoritarian political systems. Now, on the second column, you got the slave morality. Um, focus on those who are abused, oppressed, weak, or suffering, um, concerned, with the concerned with justice, equality, and fairness, works to delegitimize power imbalances, orients toward socialist or communal political systems. Now, those are the two uh, comparisons of with uh, Frederick Nietzsche uh, in his book, uh, Ge Genealogy of Morals. Uh, he was talking about the, the comparison between the mass morality and the slave morality. It is uh, kind of similar in philosophy to what Ayn Rand talks about, you know, dealing with altruism and how altruism is bad. Uh, you know, and uh, it's, you can see the comparison, almost like the similarities in uh and it kind of goes back to this, uh, the philosophy of social Darwinism, you know, survival of the fittest. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just basically saying that, uh, you know, well, things that are people, uh, systems, um, anything that, that's strong is noble, um, that, you know, that has, um, brave, that's brave, uh, confidence, you know, the things that uh, we people envy, those are the, actually the noble qualities, the so-called good qualities that we all should be striving for. 
in us uh, in society it pretty much has a twisted they 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 think that uh to be good you gotta be meek and pious and humble and all this kind of stuff and basically take an ass whooping you know turn the other cheek and stuff like that you know they they equate that to being righteous but in reality that's not the case you know because uh you gotta be able to fight back you know you gotta be assertive you gotta be confident and uh in religious people you know like christians muslims um new age people um you know people people like that they associate weakness with righteousness and uh, that's where all the confusion comes from. It's really, it's about you got to be confident, got to be confident, you got to be strong, uh, you got to be commanding. Those are the qualities that everybody should strive for. Hey guys, if you like the video, make sure you leave a comment and uh, make sure that you share the video and also make sure you like and subscribe. All right, peace.